everybody, and welcome to our first lecture in combinatorics with me. Big idea for principles of counting is just learning how to count things efficiently. Because sometimes sitting down and going one, two, three is just going to take too long. So we're going to discuss some better methods um, for counting. For instance, let's start off with maybe I wanted to talk about how many different types of spoons I could be um, looking at. We're going to keep it really simple. <laughs> there are a lot of spoons to talk about. Maybe just we'll say we can think about size of the spoon. We'll limit it to just there are big spoons and there are small spoons. And we could have the material that it's made out of. And that could be maybe we could have metal spoons. We could have plastic spoons. We could have maybe wood or even glass spoons. There we go. Lots of spoons. You could have a big spoon that is plastic. You could have a small spoon that is plastic. There are a lot of different combinations. Um, and you can think about like all those combinations using something called like um, a tree. So let's say we have a spoon and then like the first option we would look at is whether or not it's big or small. And then once we've determined if it's big or small, then we decide what kind of material it is, metal, plastic, wood, or glass. And then you would have to do those same options for if you pick a small spoon. All in all, we get down to, there could be eight different um, types of spoons that we're looking at. But then you have to ask the question, well, what if we had looked at the material first and then looked at the size? So maybe we look at spoons. Oh, that's a spoon. I can write. There you go. And then we want to talk about the material first. So metal, plastic, wood, and glass. And then from there, we talk about whether or not it's big or small. Once again, we have eight spoon choices. This, um, thinking about like combinations and how many combinations we can get is very closely related to the idea of a cross product. For instance, let's put this in terms of sets. If we do A is the set big and small, and we do B is the set, which is materials, we'll say metal, plastic, wood, and glass. Then in order to get all the spoon combinations, so spoon combinations, we would take the cross product. And that would put big with metal, plastic, wood, and glass, and then would put small with metal, plastic, wood, and glass, and you would get every combination possible for the spoons. Which means that when we want to think about um, how many different combinations, all we have to do is think about how many elements are in the cross product. So number of spoon options is going to be equal to the cardinality of the cross product, which is just the cardinality of A times the cardinality of B. On the topic of cardinality, though, that brings us um, to the idea of creating bijections, right? Remember, bijections for cardinality was just um, defining a function between the natural numbers and your set. So that's all combinatorics is as well, is creating a bijection between two finite sets, and we use the known set to count the unknown set, the known set being natural numbers. So once again, we're just creating bijective functions um, in order to count things. Let's talk about one rule in particular called the product rule. This is how we count um, how many combinations of things that we have 
um, it's just like what we just did. We have A is the first set of options. Um, and suppose that there are N many options. And then we're going to have B is the set of second options. And suppose that we have M many second options. That means that there are going to be N times M options in all. Another way of thinking about this, another way of saying product rule would be if there are N ways to do one thing and M ways to do a second thing, then there are M times N options in all for doing both of these things. So interpretation, again, this is how we count the number of combinations we can do with A and B. Let's do another example that is not spoons. Let's think about how many hands of five cards can you draw? So let's say we have a deck of 52 cards and you're gonna start drawing in order to get five cards in your hands. When you draw the first card, there are 52 possible choices. And then you're gonna draw again, but now you've, you're already holding one card, which means you can only have 51 cards left. So when you draw your second card, you have 51 possible choices for your, um, for your next card. So just between those first two cards, you have 52 in choices for the first one, you have 51 choices for your second card, which is already a very large number of combinations for just those first two cards. And then you go on, and down once you're at your fifth card, let's see, so for your third card would be 50, your fourth card would be 49 choices. And down at your fifth card, you would have 48 choices. So this one was the first card, second, third, fourth. And if we multiply these all together, you end up with like 300 million possible um, hands that you could draw. A lot of choices. Next rule that I want to talk about is not so much in the uh, world of combinations, but um, sometimes we want to count things that meet a certain requirement. And it is sometimes faster to count all of your things and then count how many things don't meet your requirement. So again, coming back to cardinality, we would like to know everything in A that isn't in B. And so we proved this theorem um, back when we did cardinality. And then specifically, if B is a subset of A, then you do get to write this. But again, B has to be a subset of A, so everything in B has to be in A as well. So again, here's our interpretation. We want to count things that are of type A, but not type B. For instance, how many integers from 0 to 500 are not divisible by 4? It is not going to be efficient to go through and be like, oh, zero is divisible by four, but one isn't, two isn't, three isn't, oh, four is, cross that one out, five isn't. That is not the efficient way to go through this. What we're going to do is we're going to count our integers. So I said sometimes it's faster to count everything and then count the number of things that don't fulfill that. So first we're going to count everything. So everything would be all of our integers. Count total number of integers. So that would be numbers greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to 500. So this is going to be 500 and one integers because you have one, two, three, all the way up to 500, but you also have zero. So you have one more than 500. So that's how many integers. And then we're going to count the number of things that don't meet the requirement that we're looking for, not divisible by four. 
So we're going to count the multiples of 4. Okay. So we want to know how many of these guys we're going to have. So we can just divide by 4 for inequality. And then that means we would have 126, again, because we got to count that zero. And now we're going to put those together, our total non-multiples. So that would be 501, so all of the integers minus the ones that were multiples. So 375. So this is an example of when we were counting things and being like kind of choosy or picky about how we counted it. Like we didn't want to count numbers that were divisible by four. Now let's talk about a different kind of um, care that we can use when we're counting. Let's say that when we're counting, we are accidentally, or accidentally, counting a particular computation multiple, but a consistent number of times. We just keep on hitting it up. Um, maybe in this case, we would say that there are d different ways of representing this particular combination or enumeration. That means that when we're done counting and we've gotten n, n is going to be divisible by d. Because we overcounted or double, or not even double counted, we just overcounted by d number of times. So that means since we counted each thing more than once, we have to divide by d in order to make sure we're not over counting something over and over and over. So what do I mean by this? Like just going back to sets, since that's what we know. Remember, I said that we don't care about sets that have elements that show up in more than once. We're just like, oh, if one showed up three times, just get rid of two of them. We only care about the fact that it showed up once. But for here, for counting, it's a little bit more formulaic in how these things show up. For instance, this example with the cards that I had earlier, I didn't distinguish between where I put where I put these cards in my hands. So if I'm drawing cards, like they're going to have to end up in a certain order in my hand. Like I'm going to look from left to right in order to see all of my cards. So let's say I have five blank spots to put my cards. When I do my first card, so first card, he can go into any one of these spots. So let's say I choose that he goes in this spot and then when I get my second card, he can now go into any one of these spots. As it stands, the way I've done things, if I were to be, um, if I had like a king of hearts here and a queen of hearts, oh, that's too scary. The Queen of Hearts uh, here. That would be different than having Queen of Hearts here and King of Hearts here. And so I've like double counted having a King and a Queen of Hearts just by shuffling the order that they're sitting in my hand. And that's not what I want to do. What I do want to do is count these all once. So I'm going to be careful and think about 
the number of places each of these things can go. So let's say I have 52 cards that I can draw for my first hand. However, I have five different locations. I can put that in my hand, but I don't want to count all of them as being different. And so I'm going to divide by five. Yes, 52 is not divisible by five, but it's okay. We'll get there. Now, if I have my second card that I want to count, I have 51 options for that second card, but now he has four places that he can go in my hand. So we're going to divide that by four. And then we have 50 for our third choice. Not shockingly, we have three locations that that could go. 49, we have two choices left in our hand. And then 48, there's only one spot left in my hand for my card. So if we look at how many um, possible hands this gives us, this is like two and a half million. So not quite 300 million possible hands. Um, but when you're playing poker, you don't care if you have a queen of hearts followed by a king of hearts sitting in your hand or a king of hearts followed by a queen of hearts. It's the same hand, it's the same card sitting in your hand. So these are the possible combinations that you can have sitting in your hand. It is about two and a half million. Let's do another one of examples like this. Let's talk about how many ways it's possible to seat 12 people at three tables each with four people per table. So I'm gonna interpret that real fast. That means we have a table with four seats. We have a table with four seats. And we have a table with four seats. Okay, so if we have 10, 12 people and we're trying to sit them all at these 12, did I say 12 tables? If we have 12 people and we're trying to sit them at these three tables how many different combinations can we come up with when we do not care about, don't care about the rotation of the table, <laughs> by which I mean, if we have Andrew, Bradley, Colin, and DJ, this seating arrangement is the same as here in red, Andrew, Bradley, Colin, and DJ. I only care about the fact that Darius is to Colin's left and Bradley is to Colin's right. Um, so these seating arrangements are the same. I don't want to count them more than once. And then last thing that I don't, don't want to um, care about is I don't care about the arrangement of the tables either. So whether I call this table one or um, this one table one, I don't care. So let's try and count up all these options. So how, how are we going to do this? We've got, we're going to pick table number one and we're going to start setting people down. We have 12 people to sit in that very first chair. No one's sitting yet. And then after that, there are going to be 11 people to sit in our second chair, 10 people to sit in the third chair, nine people to sit in our fourth chair. Now, <clears throat> this is table number one. Remember that I said, I don't care about the rotation. So this green version versus this red version, those are the same thing. I could have Andrew with Bradley to his left, and then Andrew, Bradley, Colin, Darius, or not Darius, DJ. Um, that order could show up four different times because you could have like Andrew is here and Bradley is here. 
and Colin is here, DJ is here. And then the last one would be when Andrew sits over here and we do the same order. So that's four different ways that we could have that rotation or where it's the same up to a rotation. So we're gonna divide this by four. And then also remember, I said, I don't care about the arrangement of the tables. So I'm gonna say that this is, oops, I'm gonna say that this one was table one. I had three choices to call it table one. So we're gonna divide it all by three. And then we're gonna do this again for table two. So now I have eight people left because I've sat four people down. So we've got eight, seven, six, and five people to sit here. Once again, we don't care about the rotation. There are four different, like same ways to have people at the table when you think about only who's to the left and right. And then since I've picked table one, table two has two options. And now last one, we've got our third table. We have only four people left to try and sit down. So four for that first seat, three for the second seat, two for the third seat, one last option for the fourth seat. Once again, I don't care about rotation. And this time there was only one option for what table number three was gonna be called. So then that turns into 12 factorial over four cubed times three factorial. And if we multiply that out, that's like over a million options for sitting people at tables, which uh, I look at that and I'm like, no wonder wedding receptions are like super stressful when you're trying to be like, oh, and this person sits here. And that's a lot of options to go through people. But anyway, the fact that I've started talking about the order of things and we want to be careful because we don't want to count things that would be the same thing twice. Um, this is kind of like getting into permutations. And so before I talk about all that stuff, I'm going to stop talking. So I'll talk to you all later. Bye for now.